Danny Samis celebrated his 72nd birthday this week. He played for Warwick for 27 years, opening the innings, amassing 43,000 runs and earning England call-ups between 1966 and 1977. Two things, though, will be the way that people remember his career. He joined Kerry Packer's Rebel Tour and he was the first player to introduce the now mandatory helmet. We talked in the garden of his Birmingham home. Well, Dennis, if I can take you back to, to your beginnings in Birmingham, I mean, were you, were you somebody who always saw yourself as, as being a, a county cricketer and an England player? Well, I, I, I did, Bob, really, because um, at, at school uh, I wasn't a great academic and um, um, I, cricket was, was my, my, my thing, really. Um, so I went down the county ground pretty early uh, to have coaching. I went down at nine and they turned me away, which never happened these days. And I went, I, I went back when I was ten. They said, come back when you're ten. And I think all my essays were, if you know, to tell us about um, you know, being shipwrecked on a desert island. We'd always got a bat and a ball when we, when we reached the island. So uh, um, cricket came into uh, a, a number of things. And uh, when we had matches during the summer at the end of school days, I couldn't wait to get away. And uh, my mind would, would always uh, sort of be ahead of me thinking about you know, how we we're going to get the wickets and the runs that evening, not about uh, sort of the maths lesson that you were doing at the time. Was this on the back of sort of playing cricket in the back garden when you were four with your dad, that sort of thing? Yeah, father was a, a decent club cricketer and uh, he played Saturdays and Sundays. We uh, sons used to follow our fathers and we'd have our own match. So while our dads were playing out in the middle at Birmingham Co-op, Barrows Lane, Yardley, um, we would be, the sons would be playing our own match and, and having some fun. We'd take our, our father's pads when, when, uh, when they were fielding, of course, and, and a bat that was far too big and gloves and everything that were miles too big. But, uh, I mean, we, we had fun and we played cricket and we have our match. Fair to say you were a natural then? Well, I, th I think that that would be right. I had a, a, a fair amount of, of natural ability and uh, always wanted to do it. There, there was um, there's obviously family in my life, but uh, um, cricket was was always number one and uh, always wanted to be a cricketer. Because not everybody comes into county cricket with what you would call natural ability. Some really have to work at it. I mean, you think one of your contemporaries, Jeff Boycott, for instance, he worked and worked to achieve, didn't he? Yes, he did. And, uh, I mean, and we all did, Bob. I mean, uh, even though you had a fair amount of natural ability, I always remember Tom Graveney saying to me, he said, Dennis, he said, uh, I said, how much do you practice, Tom? He said, Dennis, he said, I practice every day. And that, and that he was a senior player um, in, in the county side, in the England side, when I first started. And that really impressed me. And that's, that's I mean, I did work before that, but suddenly he was a great player, telling me he, he worked as, as hard as anybody. And so uh, you have to put the time and the hours in, you have to put in the, in the work, uh, you have to be disciplined, you have to do certain things sometimes which uh, aren't always, um, um, your mates don't always agree with, you know, are you coming out for a few beers tonight and you, you know there was a match the next day, you'd say, sorry, you know, I've got a match, I've got a bit. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it's hard, hard work, but I mean, uh, you know, it was, um, it was cricket, it wasn't, you know, an, an ordinary job, it was uh, being a county cricketer and, uh, and, and eventually an international cricketer. So at 10 years old then, when you first started having nets at Warwickshire, were you looking at the seasoned pros and, and watching them and watching their technique and learning from them? Yes, you were. And uh, Dennis Compton, I, um, um, I have a lovely story with Dennis Compton. He was my hero, as he was many people's heroes. And I used to watch him on television when television had just started then and they, they won the Ashes, I think it was, in, in 53 and Jim Laker on those, and he got all those 19 wickets, but watching Dennis play there. And suddenly I found myself in those, um, those John Player League matches, which, which started in the uh, latter 60s. Um, and I was... I was I, the, the, the Rothmans Cavaliers just prior to that and I met Dennis Compton I was batting with him I couldn't believe it there was my hero the great Dennis Compton I was batting with him and I thought well I've got to give him the strike and, and I tr try as I may I was only 15 and he was at the end of his career but you know still got obviously a big name in the game and, I, and, and he said he came down the week he said to me he said uh, look young man he said um, try and give me the strike and I said Mr Compton that's exactly what I'm trying to do but I, <laughs> I, was, I was just frozen there Frozen because there, there was my great hero, but uh, he, he scored some runs and that was that was magic. But we had some some, some wonderful players. I mean, Mike Smith. He came to us from from Leicestershire and, uh, um, and uh, he took over the captaincy in '58, which was my, my my first year on the staff. I didn't play county cricket uh, that early, but. Um, yeah, and uh, you, you do watch other players and you watch their techniques and, 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 and think, well, you know, but what you didn't want to go away from was from your natural technique. 
if you know what I mean. But we had good coaches as well. But as a, as a teenager, I mean, you, you, you liked your football as well, didn't you? And then you, you got a bad back injury, and that, that kind of maybe changed the whole course of your life, I don't know. But... Yeah, no, no, nobody talks about my footballing <laughs> experiences or, or skills or lack of, but I love my football. We played for Alton, which were the Worcester combination, and the top division of the Worcester combination had Alf Churches and, and, and uh, Highgate Uniteds and uh, um, some really top sides. And then we played in the second division, which had their second team. So we, we, Georgie Jakeman playing for us, who used to play for Plymouth Argyle and Conkley City, and one or two others had come down from Birmingham City or one or two of the teams. Uh, the Myring brothers, and we played at uh, Mosey Cricket Club on, on Streetsfoot Road. That was that was our pitch, uh, which were, were wonderful days. And then I joined the um, uh, the Wanderers, and uh, um, that was uh, mainly KES, not far away. The King Edward School boys who, who played rugby on a on a Saturday and, and soccer on a Sunday morning. And then sometimes, if if uh, if people show, I play I play on Sunday afternoons. So I play Saturday afternoons, Sunday mornings, Sunday afternoons. I just loved loved all sports really. But I, I could play a bit of football, and uh, I was never going to be good enough to play professionally. Did you um, want to? No, not really, because I, I always saw cricket as being number one, and, and, and my cricket cricket was always fortunate for me. There were stops and and and. and um, hiccups on along the way at certain times but it was it did I was fortunate it did progress so it was cricket was always going to be number one but I had this accident that you referred to and somebody came across my back and we were abroad playing in France against one of the top teams and we came down from a big height across my back and it was, the ground was very hard and uh, and something went in my back um, and I went to see a specialist and uh, he, he wanted to operate and I said what chance of ever playing cricket again and he, he sort of said well 50-50 in those days because it was early, early days on back operations and um, I, all I wanted to do was bowl again I could bat in some discomfort but um, I was having lots of treatments um, other places and I, I, I didn't have that operation and uh, I could bowl occasionally but only occasionally uh, with, they called it slip disc in, in those days uh, and it would um, obviously um, I did bowl in a final once but, but, but uh, uh, it stiffened up uh, quite considerably and uh, you couldn't bowl day in day out so I concentrated on my batting so, so was that back problem with you all through your professional career then as a cricketer? Still with me now Bob, even, even this morning, pl playing playing golf with my mates down at Edgbaston Golf Club at eight o'clock this morning. That uh, after a few holes, they all say, "Yeah, he keeps coming back." And uh, I have some very good people uh, here in Birmingham, and uh, uh, they're very helpful. They, um, you know, it takes a little bit of time to relieve it again and get me going again, and off you go again. Yeah, it's 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 always on and off. Uh, the whole of my career, give me give me problems, and probably made me a lot stiffer in in the field and. Um, but they always said I didn't like fielding, so uh, I wasn't <laughs> on the field. <laughs> well, I, I'm just astonished. I mean, when you you look back at the years you played and all you achieved as a cricketer, that you were doing this and, and frequently in some discomfort. Yeah, I, I, I was. Uh, you just went through different different periods, and sometimes it was it, it, it was great, and you you didn't feel it, and you had to get on with it. And other other times that uh, you had a lot of pain, and you got the the. Uh, the medics to work on it to try and relieve that pain and uh, different sorts of treatments and, and then after a fair few of those it would it would be okay again and off you go again but yeah you, you just had to keep somehow had to keep going and it was easier to bat uh, than it was to bowl because you've got a lot of moving joints there and putting a lot of pressure on your back and as well as your knees and your hips and everything uh, like bowlers do so um, it was a bit easier to, to, to bat than to bowl physically but uh, mentally obviously they're, they're, they're both so tough, tough, whatever you're doing. Do you remember when you first got the call up to play in the first team for Warwickshire? Yes, I do. Um, um, and that was uh, 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 quite, quite exciting. It was um, against Oxford and uh, um, it was, um, you know, it's a great occasion. To, 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 we played in the second team and I'm in and out, had hiccups on the way in the second team. And I thought, you know, am I going to make it, am I not? And then suddenly we had an opportunity uh, with one or two of the chaps retiring and uh, Dennis, you know, step up and uh, that was a, a great, very exciting occasion. And was that here or at the parks? No, that was at the, uh, that was at the parks and uh, um, I can't remember how many I scored there, but I don't think it was very many. <laughs> <laughs> but 
it was the, ex- the whole experience really was, was yes yeah well, I think, what that I think, day was about I think my first matches for, for both the second team I was run out for naught without facing a ball and I think it happened in, in, in the first county match that I played in not against Oxford at the yeah. past but the first yeah. county match that I played I got run out for naught without facing a ball so, so I had a, a, a double mm. up a double up there <laughs> so, so once you did start getting among the runs I mean do you remember the first big score you made yep um, and that was um, in '72. Really, I'd been in and out of the side with Test match calls for uh, Mike Smith and uh, um, MJK mainly, um, and I hadn't done particularly well. Maybe the odd fifty here and there, but uh, I can remember that um, um, Norman Horner Ray Hitchcock retired, and, and I said to Mike, "The opportunity," and he said, "He said yes." Um, and I think that we had Canine and Kalicharan coming along there, and it was a hard side to get to get into great players there. Um, and John James and John Whitehouse opened the innings, and they hadn't done too well. And I asked to open the innings, and it happened to get, be against Middlesex at, at Edgbaston. They said, "You want to open? You're number three or four batsman." And I said, "Well, that's the only opportunity I've got now of getting in the side." And you've, the others have played four or five matches now. They haven't got a run, six matches. Uh, I, I, I'd really like, I've got my hundreds. You asked me to go back in the second team. I've got my hundreds in the second team. I'd like to, well, that's the only way I can play first team cricket. I'd like to open. And uh, so they said, fine. And I got Bob Willis and uh, David Brown to bowl with a new ball to me in the indoor school and, let, and got stuck into me to give me the feeling of uh, opening the batting. And I was very lucky. I, can, I played a mist early on against uh, John Price of uh, Middlesex. Fred Titmus played and uh, the wicket got wet. It was uncovered wickets in those days. And the wicket turned a bit, but I played Fred Titmus decent. I went on. I was very lucky. Yeah, a bit of luck. You've got to have a little bit of luck and played well enough to go on and get a big 100, 150 and that really set me on and that was really in 1972 when uh, uh, I really got going in, the f- in, in first team category. My dad hit hiccups in and out before that. That must have been quite, <coughs> quite a moment to have, to have scored as a big 100 like that. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I was really chuffed. It was against a very good attack, Middlesex. We all seemed to be a good side in those days and uh, John Price is one of the fastest bowlers that England had. Fred Titmus, one of the greatest all-rounders, wonderful off-spinner. And uh, you got runs against a, a, a good, a decent bowling attack, and it was that was that was really pleasing on a, on a wicket that was okay first of all, but then the rain came and uh, overnight, and uh, the next day it was not so easy. So yeah. I, read, I read somewhere that, that you, you somebody said you were an absolute perfectionist. You were always tinkering with your style. <coughs> Pretty much in the in the way that Colin Cowdery was a contemporary of yours. Yes, as well. I, I, is that is that a fair comment? Yeah, I did. I I just felt there was always a way that um, there must be a way of combating every ball that's bowled to you, um, the perfect technique, I suppose. Um, and I tried different things to uh, you know if I if I got out to a certain ball, well, I, I thought there must be a technique that I can go and work on in the nets uh, to be able to play that ball and make sure it doesn't happen again. So I'd go out to the nets and work on it. There was always somebody prepared to come and have a ball to you. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think it probably took me away from my natural ability. And obviously when you start tinkering, you're doing different things, it's a bit foreign to you. I came about Eddie Barlow coming up to once and he was captain of Derbyshire, saying, Dennis, you've got a naught in the first inning, you're having a bit of a run here, what, what's the problem? I said, well, I don't know whether to stand with my feet apart and hands together and our shoulders round. And he said, um, my gosh, you have got some problems. He said, you know, I said, well, I feel uncomfortable with the crease. He said, well, what about the ball from the bowler's hand? That was the most important thing in your career as a batsman. You've got to watch the ball from the bowler's hand. That tells you whether it's up or back or whatever length it is. And I have been so uncomfortable at the wicket that I really, subconsciously, you know, forgotten about really concent. It's a relaxed concentration you've got to have uh, about the ball from the bowler's hand. And, and once he's, he got me focusing on that again, oh, away you go again and got some runs and. People who only know the modern game will be surprised uh, that A, you only ever wore white clothing and to start with it was just county matches and of course you went on to play test cricket. And you played with sleeves rolled up and wore it, wear an ordinary cap like a school cap, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, we did. But that, yeah. that was how it was. Yeah, and uh, I mean there wasn't so much the, the, the fierceness, the, the aggression in the game. The bowlers did get a, 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 a aggressive occasionally and uh, 
I can remember Brian Statham, a great England bowler, um, playing away, and I was playing him nicely, and he, he let me have a bouncer just to say, don't keep coming on the front foot to me, you know. We were put, trying to push you back, and get you thinking about it, maybe looking for it again. Um, but, you know, they, they were just great, they were great bowlers. They didn't need to keep bowling short, short, short pitch stuff at you. They picked it up and they made it move in the mid swing or, or move it off the wicket. And of course, he's, he's, he played in tandem for England with Fred Truman who of course was playing the other side of the Pennines for Yorkshire. Uh, I imagine there were one or two county battles there with Fred rolling his sleeve up and glowering at you from 22 yards away. Well, Fred was, would, always, would always give you the chat and tell you how well he was bowling. Mm. Uh, the one thing he did, he came in the dressing room before, before play started and he'd tell you how he was bowling. You know, he was bowling, he's a way swinger, was swinging it so late and uh, he got great rhythm and then if that didn't get you, well, the, 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 the nipper backer off the scene would do. And he gets you thinking about it and, and uh, if, you get, if you get past that, don't forget, I'll knock your head off, you know, sort of thing. <laughs> and he, he'd be telling you the, in the dressing room yeah. and uh, he'd, he'd try and uh, Not talk. Not what a young batsman wanted to hear really. no and he said to me he said who are you and it was my first game against yorkshire so i said uh, uh, dennis amos mr truman he said never heard of you that's two weeks i got before we start <laughs> and then he go on to proceed yeah. to tell me how he's going to get me out yeah. Yeah. and i mean when you go out to bat against the great one of the yeah. greats and yeah. he, he was still at the end of his career could still bowl because mm -hmm. he went to derbyshire after yorkshire uh -huh. and did a job for them yeah. in limited over cricket and did a very good job because he had a great action Wonderful yeah. rhythm, and uh, yeah. he could be quick, and uh, he'd do everything. Great bowler, great bowler. I remember him telling me that, that um, when he was fielding, he'd be down on the boundary, and he'd go in position where the new batsman was coming out, and, and when they turned and closed the gate, he'd say, don't bother, son, you'll be back there in a minute when I'm bowling. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Not what you wanted to hear. No. I mean, it wasn't that long, relatively speaking, before you got picked for England, was it? And you made your debut against the West Indies. That's right, yeah. I scored 160 in the Warwickshire match for the West Indies and um, therefore I came in the last Test match at the Oval uh, in 1966. Brian Close was captain, I'd scored runs against Yorkshire uh, as well that season, so I think that uh, uh, he fancied me to ha have a go. We made several changes, we'd lost the series, I think we were pretty, pretty three nil down, I think we were, um, with uh, one drawn and we came to the last, the last Test match and uh, um, I had my, my opportunity and uh, I think Kenny Barrington was in the side and I, I was given my cap and my, and my sweaters and uh, I think Ken Higgs was my roomie and he said here are they asked me to give you these and your cap and your sweaters and I think I went to bed in them you know I, I couldn't believe it that I was going to be playing for England they picked the, the 11 so it wasn't from 12 or 13 like they do uh, sometimes it was definitely 11 with I think Tony Lewis was 12th man and uh, I managed to scramble 17 very 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 nervous and uh, um, but uh, and, 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 uh, and two people got centuries. Uh, Tom, Tom Graham got a big hundred, and John Murray, and then Higgs and Snow got fifty each. Um, and I think I ran out Gary Sabers. So that, that was the test match. Wow. Took in, in those days. I was, you know, everybody talks about my fielding. I struggled in the field and how slow I was. For Selby tells a story about the side he played in with a Amis and Steele and lots of others, the worst field inside, international fielding side there's ever been. But yeah. I was quite nimble in those days. Mm. He managed to, he wanted to pick single, I managed to run him out and I don't think I was probably everybody's heroes. No. Yes, I mean I know you, you made your first start against the West Indies and your last test match was against Australia. You never played quite as well against Australia in tests, did you? I had a bad start against Australia. Um, I got a pair at, at, at Old Trafford. And uh, then I came up against Lillian Thompson, 74, 75, and they were they were uh, a real handful uh, out in Australia. Um, and um, I was playing at my best. I'd had a really good run. I'd, I'd scored a thousand runs in t Test match cricket, and um, um, up until that uh, that tour of Australia, I'd, I'd really done well. I was in a great I was in a great run, and and to be playing at the top of your game. I wish I was, age, age 30, just over, batsman in his prime then, um, and every time, you know, I just nicked one and somebody catches, mm. Chapel mainly, or Marsh, yeah. <laughs> first yeah. slip or, or the keeper, and, and I, you know, couldn't, I, I did get to 90, should have got 100 and, 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 and messed, messed up, and I should have got 100 at Melbourne, 90 odd, 30 I got at Sydney, it was one of the best of the 30s I thought I'd ever scored in my life, and uh, the clouds were, were, were you know, not great light and mm. things, that, and um, uh, but then suddenly you're playing really well. Well, okay, watch it, nicked it again, and it, I think that just affected me. You just feel, my gosh, I can't play any better than this, and that's still getting you out. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. One of the things, of course, people remember very much about you, you were a stroke maker, weren't you? Through the covers, through mid-wicket. Yeah. There, yeah. there was a style, dare I say, comparison very much with Tom Graveney, the way that he would would go for his shots and, yeah. and you got a lot of runs that way didn't you yes i did yeah i was uh, free scoring was, was was my game and uh, a lot of boundaries um i like that um when well, i had the, had the shots and everything but um you know you do go through periods where you, you're questioned somebody somebody gets the better of you which, which the australians did and uh, i did struggle against them more than anybody else um uh, they had great sides they had great sides in those days but um um, yeah, I, I, sometimes you're in a battle with somebody and you'd fight it out, fight it out. Fast bowlers would be on top of you and they'd be hitting you and maybe, you know, giving you a real going over. No helmets. We started helmets at, later in, in 77, 78 in World Series cricket. Mm -hmm. But um, and you'd be in a battle and you, you knew you'd got to fight it out. Mm -hmm. and, and some days you were in a better frame of mind. You, you know, we all get up for work for work and some days you feel up for it don't you some yeah. days you think oh no yeah. not quite sure yeah. well, been, you know i was out late last night or something like that but um um y yeah you've got to battle it out it, it was great if you did battle it out then you know you yeah. got through the worst but then you couldn't relax your concentration or get too excited about who was coming on then maybe you know not, not so good not so good bowlers you've got to Fight your way. I love scoring hundreds. But Tiger Smith always said to me, he said, Dennis, he said, when you've scored a hundred, you must go on and score another one after that. He said, because you'll learn all about yourself. You'll learn all about your shots. You'll find out that you'll play shots you never thought you had. And uh, he, he said, you must. You take guard again. And when you get to 150, take your guard again. And when you get to 200, you take your guard again. And 250, I hope you, I hope you go on and get a 300. I mean, you topped 250 a few times, didn't you? And you got a a hundred hundreds. I mean, that is a that's a terrific achievement in in anybody's book, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I think Tiger and uh, my coaches, Tom Dollery and Drew Taylor, they were all, all 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 top people, top coaches. They always instilled on me: you're going to have your days when things don't go for you, when you get your noughts and your ones. So when you're in and you're on a good wicket and you're playing really really well, you're having a bit of luck, you're playing well. Make sure you get you you make up for those days that uh, you have those. Uh, not quite so good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, you mentioned there about uh, getting hit by the Australians and, and uh, even the other one from Brian Statham going back a few years. Uh, you are always credited with being the man who brought the helmet into the English game. Now, is, is this true? I've never never been sure. Yeah, yeah. It happened in uh, 1977. We signed up for World Series cricket and um, we were going to Australia. There were 18 fast bowlers who all bowled at 90 to 95 miles an hour. So I thought, my gosh, you know, we, you know, we did well to get through Lillian Thompson, 74, 75, without somebody getting a serious injury. Um, they've got more of them this time. So what are we going to do? And uh, I, I thought about the helmets, and I, I just said to my contemporaries, Tony Gregg, Bobby Warmer, Derek Underwood, Alan Knott, John Snow, the people who were going to World Series Green, what about a helmet? And Tony Gregg said, that'd be great. I mean, Kerry, would, Kerry Backer would love innovation. So anything like that, we're going to play some floodlit cricket, we're going to helmets, coloured clothing, white cricket balls, those sort of things. Um, that would, I think, I think that like, and, and he said that's, that's sensible as yeah. well. And is it right that it, it, it was basically a motorcycle so helmet for the first mo time? Motorcycle helmet, made in Birmingham, made of Kevlar, not, not fibreglass, because Kevlar was lighter, and, but still a very good protective material, and a fibreglass uh, 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 visor that um, would take a double barrel shotgun from 22 paces, so I thought it would take a cricket ball from Did, did you 22. find some of the fast bowlers thought, oh, here's something to aim at? Yeah, I mean, when, as soon as I went out, I mean, I got so much stick in, 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 the, uh, in, in the practice, the warm-up games, you know, hey, Amos, where's your motorbike, mate? You know, they were shouting from the outer, and they were giving me so much stick. And of course, skateboards were in, hey, Amos, where's your skateboard, mate? And uh, yeah, you, you, they did let you, let you have it. But the, the, the helmet helped, and uh, in, in that first year, uh, the late David Hooks was trying to hook Andy Roberts at the Sydney Showground because we couldn't play at the tradition, traditional grounds. So they had a, a curator there called a groundsman called John Maley who made wickets in trays in, in concrete, 30 yards long, and they would hovercraft them across the outer and drop them in the hole in the middle of the ground right. so the, the mm -hmm. male went into the female and they connect them up with electrodes and sprinkling systems mm -hmm. but the wicket was already made outside the ground before it came in but just to finish it off and uh, we played on those wickets they were good wickets and Andy Roberts had bowled to and David Hooks and I remember watching the match and he he was through bang crack and uh, no helmet 
and he was supping through a straw for six weeks with a broken jaw. And he came to me after six weeks and he said, because uh, I'd sent out for some more helmets in the meantime, because lots of others said they want them. Mushtaq Mohammed, Zahir Abbas, Barry Richards, Tony Gregg, you know, Alan Knott, they all wanted them. And so I'd sent out for another half a dozen. But he came to me and said, I want your helmet. I'm going to play against the West Indies tomorrow, same ground, and Andy Roberts is bound to come up and let me have it again. Can I wear your helmet? So he put my helmet on. And he went out, and sure enough, the, the first ball was from Andy Roberts. We were there watching it again, it was straight at his head again, another bouncer, where he'd been hit six weeks, before, and he hooked it this time for six out of the ground. It was a wonderful shot. And Richie Benno said, that is one of the great defining moments of cricket. He's been supping through a straw for six weeks, and here he has come out with the helmet, given him the confidence, and he hooked a six. Were there many dents on that helmet? <laughs> it didn't. It didn't actually dent the helmet. Sometimes it, it, it might crack it, but it's such a, a, a small impact point. It can still bruise bruise your head. And uh, people who say, "Well, you know, everybody goes out now, and they couldn't care less about being hit because now they've got a helmet on." No, that's not. It's not right because it, it's it still it still hurts and gives you a bruise on the on the head. But of course, they put peaks on them. And then we started the grills. We started the grills after the uh, the polycarbonate visors, so it'd be cooler, mm. they'd be lighter, and it wasn't much uh, so much like a like a motorcycle. But Bobby took years for them to take off, mm. but now they're compulsory, aren't they? Uh, school boys, yes. School school girls have to have to wear them unless they have a letter to say otherwise. Uh, and I mean, indeed, your your when you were still at Warwickshire, your captain Andy Lloyd still is the shortest Test career ever, isn't it? Yep. He got hit on the head. Yeah. Uh, and he was wearing a helmet. Yeah. Um, so they were not a total failsafe. Phil Hughes, who so sadly was killed earlier this year, yep. in exactly the same situation. Yeah. Uh, but at least there was some protection there, wasn't there? Yes, absolutely. And uh, they have modified them now, to, to, mm. so that we don't have hopefully another situation like uh, that tragedy to, to Phil Hughes. But um, yeah, I, I believe they they've played a great part in, 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 in cricketers' lives, and also for fielding, not just batting. Fielders would come really close yeah. in the helmet, and, and they say, "Well, that's unfair. He, he, he's coming too close." I used to say, "I don't mind how close he comes because if I hit it, he's not going to catch it. Mm. He's only going to catch it if it if I fend one off and he's there mm. to, to stand underneath. Mm. But if I really hit the ball, he can't stop. He's too close. Mm. So I've got a gap there. Mm. So I didn't mind anybody coming that that close. I thought that was a, a poor argument against the helmets." But they gradually came in, and um, um, I mean, it started with club cricketers having one per per eleven, one per team. Uh, Schoolboy cricketers, one per per school school team, and, uh, and and gradually they came in, and everybody everybody's got got one in. So it was nice to have played a part. We never thought it would happen, but we thought, you know, this was this was um, something that I felt that uh, you need, needed protection with fast bowling, become more aggressive, people bowling more short pitch balls, bouncers at the head. Um, that the game had changed, and uh, I f felt it was right. But uh, I, you know, really surprised that it that it did it did take off as it did. You said that the game has changed. I mean, it's almost unrecognisable as as the game that you played, which was a much gentler game. There wasn't, as you say, the aggression not just in the in the speed of the ball, but in the you know the sledging that goes on and all the rest of it, and and, and all the you know the the T20 blast and all the things we've got now. Do you mourn the passing of, of, of your era of cricket, Dennis? It was a wonderful era, Bob, that, that we played in, and uh, we played with, uh, you know, a lot of the great, the greatest, the greatest players. I mean, Gary Sobers, and, uh, to name but one, but there were so many. Um, it was it was a wonderful game to play, I and mean, we we'd go up the, afterwards, wouldn't we, and have a pint, and uh, you know, you chaps used to come and join us occasionally, and we'd have we'd chat with the umpires, and have a pint with them, and chat with the opposition. Um, it was just a, a, a great game um, and, and lots of cricket, but why not lots of cricket? You know, that's it's a short life, short career, and um, um, wonderful. I, the game has changed, they've made it more professional, and I, there's lots of improvements. Fielding has changed out of all recognition, uh, and uh, it's a great game to watch. The limited over game, as, uh, as the white ball game, the red ball game, as they call it, uh, that has changed. And we, we played in, uh, we started uh, playing Gillette Cup cricket, Provincial cricket, 65 overs Gillette Cup cricket started in 1964, was it? And uh, that was 65 overs, then it came down to 60, and then it, 55, then 50 with Benson and Hedges, and then we played 40 over John Player League, didn't we, which was wonderful. I'd never played 2020, but Bob, I would have loved to have done that. I was I, about to ask you how you enjoy watching that. I, I think that is wonderful. 
And some of the shots they play, the reverse shots, and when they can eat it for six, and they're right-handed batsmen, they play that. Yeah, they practice it, but you still need a lot of skill and a lot of strength to be able to hit mm. to play those. And the scoops and the, uh, and uh, uh, well, uh, they, they, they have some so many names for them. I just I just think that um, it, I, I feel sorry for the bowlers sometimes, but I think the bowling's getting better. People are mixing it up a lot more and not uh, advertising what's coming down. Um, and I just think the sixties they hit these days. They hit the ball out the ground. I mean, it's just. Mm. Um, and uh, I mean, we didn't need to do that quite so much. Yes, we did off when we played short-term, short-form cricket. In the last ten overs, you went for it. But uh, you know, they have heavier bats now and are stronger, and uh, um, than probably we, we used to work out. But they, they probably uh, build up a lot more these days. Um, but I just think, yeah, it's it's, it's a great game, and uh, I don't know whether they have the fun that we did. Um, because they don't drink so much, do they? But no. uh, if they're not playing, they they probably let their hair down. Yeah. yeah. Do the uh, Do you think that the county grain, the county game is in danger uh, of dying? Well, I don't. I don't think that um, you know county cricket um, per se um, can die because we need that for Test match cricket. And you know what will come in the next twenty five years? The game will change again. I mean, look over my career it's 50 years in the game how much the game has changed and you know we talked about Gillette Cup 65 overs in 1960s and 50 overs and 40 overs now 20 um, and uh, um, it, it, it's such, such a spectacle I mean the traditionalists didn't want short form cricket but now now they come they, they you know there aren't many that don't enjoy it because the skills are fantastic in it it's really really exciting so um no, I mean, uh, it, I think we need counter cricket. I think the game needs an, an overhaul. I think we need to look at that, and I think that under the new chairman coming in, Colin Graves, I think that's that what he will do. Um, he was good with Yorkshire. He went in there. They weren't playing particularly well, and um, they weren't having much success. And he ruffled a few feathers and said, "This isn't good enough." And that's that's that's, you know, he's a businessman, successful businessman but loving cricket as well. And it's good to see that people, the businessmen that are coming into it, you know, they love the game, they want to do the right things for the game and not necessarily for, for themselves. And, uh, and he's one of them. And, um, and Giles has done a, a, a good job, um, the, the outgoing chairman, but now times change, don't they? Somebody comes in, new ideas, need to refresh, need to have a look at it. And I think that um, we do need to change that 2020, in my opinion, and how they're gonna do it, that's, that's always the, it's always the devil in the detail, isn't it, about uh, how it's going to change? But uh, we, we, we do need to, we need the big names to come over, and that looks as though it's happening. We've got Brendan McCullum coming to Warwickshire, fantastic signing. We need all those big games, the top names in one day cricket to come over because we're playing a different game, aren't we? I think it showed up in the World Cup. They're playing a different game to us, um, and we need to be there. And I think the only way to get there is to have these chaps and come and come and teach it and show it to us. And, and play at that level over a period of time can take us, you know, up, up, up to the level that they are playing at at the moment. The revolution in your playing time, of course, came by an Australian businessman called Kerry Packer. It wasn't everybody's cup of tea, and there was what was called the Rebel Tour of South Africa, of which you were a part. Um, did you think at the time about the polit political side of it? Was it a wise thing to do? Well, I didn't think about the, the, the political side at all, and that was probably uh, um, I should have done. But I thought about the cricketing side. I thought that you know we, we, we were not getting paid uh, very much money in those days. It was still great to, to, to be playing for your country, but I played 50 Test matches, and I was sort of in and out a little bit. And I, I, I just thought, you know, here are the top 60 players. I want to be part of that, and. Um, I got a hundred in the One Day International against Australia at the, at the Oval, and Tony Gregg said Kerry's at the hotel, in, and uh, Richie Benno, and um, one or two of his other chaps. I, I forget the, um, who they were now, but uh, and he wants to see you, and uh, I went and met him, and he convinced me that's the way to go, and I'd be free to play for Warwickshire. And I know I rang Warwickshire straight away and said I want to go this way. 
and I want to be part of, of World Series. I want to play with the greatest players. Mm. He's got the six best players, 60 best players in the world. I want to be part of that. Um, and But I will, I'll, I'll be free to play for Warwickshire. And uh, that was the decision I took. Um, I was paid a certain amount of money. I knew that other people, bigger stars, were getting more. That's fair enough. They were bigger names, better players, greater players. But uh, it, it enhanced what we could do and uh, buy a house and all those sort of things that you want to do. And so I, I, I did it for those reasons. I look back and, and, you, and you do it at the time. And I, and I think that when I look back on it now, I made the right decision at the time, but you know, would you have done it differently? Mm. Maybe over so many years now thinking about it, you would. Mm. But at the time, I felt it was the right decision to do for, the, for, for, for my family and be yeah. part of the best players in the world. Mm. And uh, to be fair, the England squad that went out there were very strong, weren't they? There were some very big players in there. There were people at the time who said, look, this is going to set back the cause of apartheid and South Africa getting back into world sport. Did you get that from anybody when you were out there at all? Well, obviously there were the people who were anti, yeah, yeah. But um, you know, you're talking about South Africa now, mm. rather than the uh, Packer, mm. yeah. Um, yes, we we did, but um, you know, they, they, they wanted to break down the barriers. Sport was it was could break breaks down all barriers, can't can't it? I mean, uh, we, we've seen what uh, what it can do in all in all countries, really. Um, so you, you can use sport to to, to to help situations. I feel and. Uh, um, it was a, a wonderful opportunity. I love South Africa. I'd been out there coaching at schools in South Africa for six months at a time and uh, in the winters and, and absolutely loved it and still do. Um, and playing against their teams and trying to help them through this period of difficulty, um, you know, it was. I didn't play for England again. I think some of the chaps that did came to, went to World Series cricket, went to um, South Africa. You know, I, I was a, you know, back when I was a double rebel. But yet I ended up with the establishment. I mean, uh, well, is it, it going to be to a poacher or? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I was about to say. I mean, for, for all that you, you got the three-year ban, wasn't it? I recall at the time. Yeah. Um, which you probably expected anyway. But you ended up as an England Test selector. Yeah. So somewhere along the line, they obviously thought, well, well, you know, this chap could be useful to us. <laughs> Well, or was I mean, it just that there was a, a, a sort of a change of thinking? I mean, admittedly, from the South African point of view, they were back in, in world cricket then yeah. anyway, weren't they? There was a big change, wasn't there? I mean, Mandela, Mandela came along mm. and everything changed with, with South Africa and uh, um, the, the authorities sorted themselves out. But time passed by, you know, the wounds started to heal. And, uh, and I think that, um, you know, I, I, I love the game um, and, and, and I thought they they thought that I had something else to offer, so, you know, to, to be able to join as a selector, then to join the board of the England Wales Cricket mm -hmm. Board and, and, and play a very small part, very small part, over ten years with the England Wales Cricket Board, and uh, I, I, that, that was really exciting, and work with, you know, England captains Michael Vaughan and uh, Andy Strauss, and that, 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 that was the England team, that was, that was really exciting to be chairman of cricket and, and things like that, was, was just, uh, you know, wonderful, I never thought that that were coming, and uh, I was given the opportunity, and uh, um, that 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 was that was brilliant after after what had happened before and everything. And but uh, yeah. did you see the game and, and players in a different light because you kind of moved over, hadn't you? You'd come from you'd gone from the dressing room, and, and here you are. You were the headmaster, and, and uh, was that was that a role that, that you you kind of enjoyed? And you thought, wow, was I like that when I was a player? Yeah. I loved the players. I was very much a player's man and always tried to back um, the cricketing executives at, at, at the England Wales Cricket Board because they were good people and, and they had good ideas and you know, um, you're there to be shot at a little bit when you come up with, with ideas, putting ideas forward mm -hmm. and um, they're there to be uh, discussed and uh, um, having, having a look at. But I, I just, good people there and good it was just wonderful to work with with, with, with the team and to, and to bring in central contracts and um, it was just an exciting team time to be around to be around the game the game changing and um, I, I was just you know I, I just played my very small part in that and uh, I, I, I was very proud to have done it and of course you never really went away from Edgbaston did you because you, you ended up there running the place you were chief executive for how many years now? Yes, now. 12 years, 12 years. Yeah. No, that, that and you oversaw some serious changes in, 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 in everything there didn't you at the time and, yeah. and brought in 
Ryan Lara. Yep, great ground developments and, uh, and, and bringing in top players. And I, I just thought that at Warwickshire we hadn't probably had enough, as much success as we should have for a big club. And uh, uh, Bobby Warmer at the coach, and that was uh, exciting times. Um, people like Sean Pollock, Brian McMillan, uh, wonderful, wonderful overseas players. And uh, um, that year, 1994, when we, we had that wonderful year that uh, we had a great side, a Warwickshire side, and Brian Lara, the catalyst, who did it all for us, three out of four trophies. They, they were just great days. You have your problems as well. Things don't always go smoothly, but uh, um, somehow we managed to get over them and, 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 and keep going. And yeah, we transformed the, 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 the game and the success and the ground and everything. But you know, when, you, when you've done your, your time and 10 or 12 years is, 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 is probably enough. Um, you get somebody else who comes in. Well, look, they, they, they did a, a wonderful pavilion, which we'd been thinking about, trying to do, and, and working at it, trying to get uh, people on site to support us and help us and things. But they they did it, and that was a great achievement as well. So it's nice to think that. And I look back and think all the the great administrators, Leslie Deakins, who was there for 20, 30 years at Warwickshire, and uh, uh, what an administrator he was, mm. <clears throat> and the riders of. Calthorpes, the people, the great tradition that the club had each had played a part, and it was nice to have played a part in the history of the club. And then, you know, we're only passing through, aren't we? As I keep saying to everybody, we do our bit, and somebody else comes on, yeah. they do their bit, and so it goes on. How did you come to get Brian Lara? Because I mean, at the time, that was the marquee signing of all time, wasn't it? We were very lucky, Bob. Um, very lucky. MJK was, was uh, a manager of the England side at, at the time. And we had signed uh, Manage Prabhaka. Um, Dermot Reeve was captain and wanted, wanted him. And he thought he would do a really great job, especially in limited over cricket. And he'd had a lot of success in international for India at that level. <clears throat> so, um, and then he had an injury, had a back, back problem, and uh, um, we had to um, um, cease his contract. And we had to start looking who else is there. And of course, Brian Lara was starting to score runs and, and, and what a player against England. And uh, we said to uh, we had one or two committee people out there at the time, and, and MJ came. We said, you know, I think the, the cricket committee would like uh, would like Brian Lara, um, and we signed him the day before. He scored that he broke Sobers' record, the, yeah. the 365 he got. Mm -hmm. Because the next day, you know, if we signed him for X X pounds, you know, the next day he was X X X X X. I was say. Yes, yes, yes. Unbelievable. And Jonathan Barnett let us know that. Jonathan Barnett, we did. I did the. He was uh, the agent, wasn't he? He was the agent and did the mm -hmm. deal with. And uh, and he never let me forget that. But the whole of the year and trying to find Brian. At sometimes, you that, know, Jonathan was making him work to to earn his extra money. That that must have been the only time anybody's got one over on Jonathan Barnett as an agent, <laughs> though. I would have thought. I mean, uh, and it, it, it's a good point you make. Um, but I mean, as you say, simply excellent times and, and Warwickshire has always been progressive, hasn't it? I mean, uh, there used to be, there was a time when they went through winters where there seemed to be a bloodletting within the committee and that, you know, you kind of thought for it. But when it came to, the, to April, they were always there, they were always challenging, weren't they? Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, you always do have problems and uh, there are always people who want to make changes and some people aren't always prepared to, to see, feel it's the right change but you've got to keep moving forward as you say and we, we did ha we have very good committees at, at Warwickshire, good people who always saw that we needed to keep the club moving, we needed to, be, to keep it at where it was which was one of the best test match venues, one of the best county clubs in the country and in the world. And Edgbaston uh, has got a tremendous name wherever you go, every cricketing world, all, all over the world, uh, and, and, and the club as well. And, uh, um, that, and that's you know, what, you, what, you, what, yeah. what, you, what you want to hang on to. Nowadays, you, you've uh, just celebrated a birthday this week, and you've, you've, you're still playing golf. What else do you do with your time? Because you're not a man to sit around, are you? No, no. I'm, well, I'm, I'm always doing something, as, as you quite rightly say. But I've got into bridge. <laughs> okay. And, and uh, I just uh, I've played for a lot socially over the years, and uh, I, I put my, I put myself as a, as a, um, a great enthusiast. Uh, but not a great player. But certainly, uh, mm. um, the system has changed. We used to play a strong note on that, a weak note on that. Won't bore people too much about bridge. But uh, we've been reprogrammed, and uh, we've got a wonderful teacher. Big group of us uh, from Edgbaston Golf Club and Edgbaston Priory Tennis Club that uh, are, have got this teacher on the go, and uh, we're playing our bridge there and Mosley Bridge Club. And I, I, I just love it. Competing, you, you can compete as well. But um, um, I'm learning. But uh, the only problem is that uh, at my age now that 
that uh, um, you, you know you learn a bit and then you forget it the next, <laughs> the next day but uh, I, yeah. I, I love it and uh, golf I play a lot of golf I'm very much involved with the MCC and the seniors golfing societies and uh, uh, I, I enjoy that family grandchildren um, down south so uh, yeah that, uh, lot, lots of things I'm still go and watch cricket down and take some mates down and, mm. and, and uh, we'll be down there this summer especially uh, watching Brendan McCullum and, and uh, yeah nice. okay so far touch wood yeah. um, uh, not too many um, new parts but uh, <laughs> I don't feel I'm far away <laughs> and I suppose it's only right you've actually got a beautiful cricket field in your back garden haven't you KES Edgbaston, yeah, King Edward School Edgbaston, and uh, uh, a great mate is the uh, chief master. Um, and prior to him, I, 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 the, the former chief master is, is my uh, golfing partner, my foursome partner at Edgbaston, and, and Roger Dancy, and now John Clawton. Um, John, John and I played cricket together, he played for Warwickshire. Uh, he had an injury, had to give up, and uh, he went into finance, didn't enjoy that, and uh, I went into teaching, which was his love. Finished up um, Eton and house master, and then came to Sully Hall as chief master, and ended up back at his school where he, where, where he, where he started his education uh, as chief master. And um, yeah, I'm, I mean, they've been very good. I have, a, I have a gate that goes through into the ground, that, uh, and I had to do some coaching, which which was lovely. I did three years coaching uh, for them. And talent uh, spotting for Warwickshire as well. Well, if yeah, always always on the always on the lookout for for, for talent and. Uh, um, we've become uh, jolly good friends, and uh, yeah, it's a lo lovely place, lovely place to live. A Birmingham boy who's never had to move very far, and and yet, you know, you you've just had the the perfect life, really, haven't you? Well, I, I, I've got uh, um, a lot going for me, Bob. And uh, 50 years in the game of cricket was just wonderful. 30 years playing, and 20 years as an administrator, and I was very, very lucky. And uh, a great club, great game. Um, um, uh, cricket in this country, um, and um, you know, people have, have given me the opportunity. So, uh, and it's nice to be able to put something back as well. And uh, um, so, uh, involved in, with the Lord's Tavern, as you probably know, and uh, doing a little bit there, and um, also the um, uh, Council for uh, Cricket Societies. Which, which, uh, so there's always there's always little things that you can help to put back and and uh, keep, keep you out of mischief, hopefully. Dennis Amos, appreciate your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bob.